So take your Bibles with me today and turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. So today we start a, a new series that we're simply titling Broken. Broken. Broken by our sin. Rescued by His grace. We're going to be developing that in the next couple of weeks. So in preparation for this, I asked Vicki if she would go around the house and collect everything in our house that's broken. And I just assume that, so, so I called one day and said, hey, we got this series of broken. I want you to go around the house and just collect everything around the house that's broken. And so I assume when I come home, there'd be just this big stack of broken stuff there. Well, that wasn't the case. When I got home, she only had two things. I think I have a picture of it up there. She only had this, this music box. And so it's special. I picked up for a second. That music box on the right, I gave it to her years ago. I think it for one of our anniversaries, and it's broken. It doesn't work anymore. But she's held on to it. And the other is just something I bought in Guatemala. Or where did I buy it? I bought it in Guatemala where our kids are. It's cracked, and we have it up on the back porch. And so I asked her, I said, Vicki, where is all the rest of our broken stuff? I mean, don't we have more broken stuff? And her response to me, she looked at me like I had four eyes, which she does quite frequently. And so she looked at me like I had four eyes, and she simply made this statement. She said, Brian, we don't have it because we throw the broken stuff away. We don't keep the broken stuff. Now, I don't want you to think that, you know, the Burke Holders have so much money, so our dryer stops working, we just throw it away, and we'll get a brand new dryer every time. We do attempt to, to, to fix things, but when things break, we don't hold on to things that break. We generally get rid of those things. And I would venture to say that unless you're a hoarder, you probably do the exact same thing, right? When something's broken, it no longer seems useful to you. Some people, though, you ever watch the program American Pickers? Anybody on the History Channel like Oh, yeah, so we've got some American Pickers fans here. Vicki and I like watching the show American Pickers. So there are some people that have the tendency to see something that is broken. In other words, they're able to see through the brokenness. And they are in, they're able to envision not what something is, but they're able to envision what something can be instead of what it is. So here's what I want us to get to you this morning. That's the way that God sees us. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our brokenness and throw us in the trash can. Can I get an amen for that? Aren't you glad God doesn't look at you and say, my word, Brian, there's just way too many cracks in your life. Put it out in the trash can. We'll just get a new version of you. But God sees our brokenness. But God not only sees what we are right now in our brokenness, but catch this, he sees what you and I can be in Jesus Christ. And here's, here's the theme of our sermon series. Your brokenness, my brokenness, makes us valuable to God. Catch that today. Your brokenness and my brokenness makes us valuable to God. He doesn't reject us because we're broken, as I already said. He doesn't throw us away. Rather, He keeps us. And He restores us. And He makes us what He desires for us to be. So the idea is this, that when you and I admit our brokenness and we turn to Jesus, God breaks in to our life. And he transforms us. And he makes us into who he desires for us to be. So we're going to flesh that out in the next four weeks. And so today we're starting in Psalm 51 and verse 17. Just one verse. Psalm 51 and verse 17. We're actually going to keep your finger there after we read it. We're going, to, we're going to flesh that out in that chapter today. Psalm 51 and verse 17. Here's what David says. David says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Can we read that together? Let's read that together. I want to kind of get your participation in this today. So let's read that verse together. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, 
a broken and a contrite heart, God, you will not despise. So here's the first point. It's so simple, and yet it's so profound. The first point, very simply, is this. You are broken. Let that sink in for a second. You are broken. That's not a contem condemnatory statement because not only are you broken, but guess what? I'm broken too. And not only are you broken, but every person here today is broken. In other words, there are some flaws in our life that need to be fixed. No one here is perfect. Look around. There's not a single perfect person here today. There's not a single one of us who are perfect today. No one is perfect. No one is flawless. We are all imperfect minds. So, so, so catch this. In, this. in this journey towards restoration, in this journey towards becoming who God wants us to be, the very first step in that is to admit your brokenness. So we want to do that today. We want to admit our brokenness. So say with me this morning, I'm broken. Say it with me. I'm broken. Boy, you weren't convinced about that at all. Say that with me today. I am broken. One more time. I am broken. Turn to the person beside you and say, I'm a hot mess. Go to do it. I'm a hot mess. As I look out over here today, I am looking out over a group of people who are a hot mess. You are broken. You desperately need fixing. As I was, as I was thinking about this, so I thought of my, my weird mind. I thought of the um, Christmas special, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And you remember why? So, so as, as they're on the journey there, they get to the island of misfit toys. Remember that? That is Rudolph, right? So some of you right? That is Rudolph, maybe. So I'm on that. So, so I island, and I thought, that's us! <laughs> that's Hollywood Community Church! And we're supposed to be a jack-in-the-box, but we're really Charlie, and so we can't function. All right, why? We are all broken. It's so important for us to understand that. Any steps towards recovery, any journey that is going to lead us to where God wants us to be, begins with the recognition of our failures, our defeats, and our, de and our deficiencies. Let's admit today, can we admit that's not easy for us, right? It, it's really easy for me to see the failures, the deficiencies in somebody else. I can look at other people today and I can tell you, man, here are all of their weaknesses. But it's really tough for me to see my own. And I imagine that you're the exact same we tend to respond, though, in one or two ways. So we tend to do one or two things when it comes to our weaknesses and all of that. My OCD is kicking that pretty straight this out right here. We tend to do, we tend to do, wouldn't it be terrible to live with me, right, with me, huh? So, so, so when it comes to our weaknesses and our brokenness, we tend to respond in one or two ways. We either blame others, and so we're really good at the blame game. I'm this way because my parents didn't love me. I'm this way because I come from a broken home. I'm, a, I'm, I'm this way because my boss doesn't appreciate me for who I am. Yeah, I have an anger problem, but my kids provoke me to anger. My wife ignores me. I know I have a problem with pornography, but it's not my fault. Because my wife doesn't give me the attention that I need. It's really easy for us to view our problems and dismiss them and throw them off by blaming someone else. By the way, if you do that, you're not the first person to do that. Remember Adam in the Garden of Eden? So, so God, God comes down one day and says, Adam, where are you? And Adam's like, well, I'm hiding from you. And God's like, why are you hiding from me? He said, because I'm naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree in the midst of the garden from which I told you not to eat? And, and rather than Adam saying, I did, I fess up, I did it. What did Adam say? Yeah, the woman that you gave me, God. It, it, it wasn't my fault, it was 
her fault, and ever since the beginning, guys, we've been blaming Mark Waltz on our problems. All right? We do what? We tend to blame other people for our brokenness. We not only blame, blame other people, but we have a tendency to deny it. We not only play the blame game, but we also smile through our denials. Do we not? I don't drink too much. Hey, I might have a beer every now and then, but I don't drink too much. I don't have an anger problem. Yeah, I blow up a couple of times a week. But I don't have an anger problem. I'm not being unfaithful to my wife. Yeah, I'm flirting a little bit at work. But, but I'm not being unfaithful uh, to my wife. I'm not an absentee dad. Yeah, I know I should be there more for my kids, but I'm not an absentee dad. I don't misuse drugs. I'm not a compulsive shopper. I can control my gambling. We can go on and on. And we what? We deny our problems. It's not me. It's somebody else. Well, God talks about that in his word. Let me show you a verse. In Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. So powerful this verse. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So God says, listen, if, if you want me to bless your life, if you want to experience my grace, if you want to experience my power in your life, listen, don't hide your sins. Don't cover it. Confess it. Admit it. Admit your brokenness. The second thing, if you're following along, is this. Not only admit it, but confess your brokenness. Confess your brokenness. The word confess is an interesting word. It's found throughout Scripture. We know it in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word confess has the idea of being in agreement with God. The, the word confess means that I see myself not as I see myself, but I see myself as God sees. And so when I confess, I'm coming to God saying, God, I see this sin, not in my self-justification that I would normally have, but God, I see this sin as you see this sin. And I confess, Lord, the sin grieves me. One of the great examples, I believe, of confession is found in the book of Isaiah. If you've read, read through the book of Isaiah, you might know what I'm talking about. So Isaiah was commissioned as a prophet to the nation of Israel. And he was basically a prophet of doom. So he was supposed to go to the Israelites and basically call out their sin and enumerate their sin. So if you read the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah does a great job of that. So he goes to the Israelites and he basically says over and over again, you have an older translation, he says, Woe are you! Over and over again. And you're in trouble. God's going to judge you. You're terrible people. You're sinners. You're wicked. You're disobeying God. You're not doing what God wants you to do. Over and over again, he pounds the Israelites with their disobedience and with their wickedness doing what God told them to do. And we come to chapter 6 of Isaiah. And Isaiah experiences something different. He begins the chapter by saying this. In the year that it came, Zion died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he gives this awesome description of the vision that he had of God. And it's amazing at the end of that vision of God, he doesn't turn to the Israelites and say, Woe are you. But he changes and he says, Woe am I. Woe is me. I'm not sure whether that's great, correct grammar or not. Woe am I, woe is me, for I am undone. I have seen the Lord of hosts, and I see myself in all of my wickedness. You see, church, here's what we, what we have a tendency to do. And when I say we, this is the generic we. This isn't me telling you what your problem is. This is me telling us what our problem is. We have a tendency to compare ourselves by everybody else. So we come to church and we look at the people around us. And we don't verbalize this. We never verbalize this. But we kind of sit around and we look at the people around us.
us, and we feel pretty good about ourselves. I'm better than Mike. I'm a, I'm a much better Christian than Mike. I know I'm better than Stanton, and I'm probably better than Dave. I don't know, maybe, maybe Steve's better than me, but I'm pretty close. We're running neck to neck on all of that. And so we sit back and we look at everybody else and we can cross our arms and we can feel pretty good about ourselves because we're comparing ourselves with each other. What we've done in the church today, quite frankly, is we have lowered the standard. The standard that we're trying to meet up to is everybody else. And as long as we think we're as good as everybody else, we're satisfied with ourselves. And what we need, church, today is a vision of God. We need to see God in all of his holiness and God in all of his righteousness. And when I see God in all of his holiness and all of his righteousness, I can respond in no other way than to admit my brokenness and to confess my brokenness before it happens in our churches, especially here in the United States, and if I can be critical for just a moment, in our churches in the United States, we've become good at being religious. We become really good. And we think really highly of ourselves. And we don't see ourselves as God sees us. We see ourselves as we want to be seen. So we fail to see our own brokenness. We fail to see ourselves as God sees us. You are broken today. You may say, Brian, I've been a believer for 40 years. You're broken today. Brian, I've taught a life group for years. You are broken today. Brian, I got a perfect marriage. You're broken today. Brian, I got great kids. You are broken today. We are all broken. And we are in need of someone to rescue us. Until we recognize our brokenness, we can never become who God wants us to become. I'm defining your outline brokenness this way. It's a recognition of spiritual bankruptcy and a longing to be rescued. Brokenness is a, is a recognition, and we'll flesh that out just a little more in a few moments, but it's a recognition of my spiritual bankruptcy. I don't have anything that I can really present to God. I realize that all of my righteousness is just like filthy rags, and, and God, I come to you broken, and I come to you humble, because there's nothing that I can really give to you that would, that would satisfy you in and of myself. God, I am spiritually bankrupt. I am dependent upon you. That's where God wants us to be. And church, I would submit this today. That until we get to that place in our lives, we can play church Sunday after Sunday. We can be faithful people. As we'll see in just a few moments, we can fast. We can tithe. We can do all of those things. But until we reach a place of spiritual contrition, we're not where God is. Designed for us to be. Amen. Say with me again today. I'm broken. I'm broken. Please say it like you mean it. I'm broken. I'm broken. I'm broken. If I said amen today, and we ended the message right there, you'd walk away saying that was like the most discouraging message I've ever heard in my entire life. Brian preached to us and called us an island of misfit toys today. But that's not the end of the message. Notice the second point in your outline. Not only are you broken, but your brokenness actually makes you valuable to God. Catch that, please. Let that sink in your mind and let it, let it, let it, let it flow all the way down to your hearts. Your brokenness makes you valuable to God. You see, there's a paradox. The paradox is this. The more you recognize your brokenness and your dependence upon God, the more usable and more valuable you are to Him. That was really good. I'm not, I'm not sure whether you caught it or not. Let me say it again. The, the more you recognize your brokenness,
and your dependence upon God, the more usable, the more valuable you are. That's counterculture. That's counter-religious culture right there. We want to believe, now i got everything I need to be. I want to lift myself up to my bootstraps. I am self-dependent. I am a self-made man. I'm not only a self-made man, but I'm a self-made Christian. And I know that I needed Jesus to be saved but from the point of my salvation. But now I want you to know that I'm doing this on my own. Are you really? Are you really? You see, the more you recognize your brokenness, the more you recognize your dependency upon God, the more valuable you become to Him, and the more usable you become to Him. Let me show you what I mean. Go back to Psalm 51. We read verse 17 just a few moments ago. I want to I go back just a little bit. I want to understand the context. So Psalm 51 is David's psalm of confession. You know the story, right? Many of you do. I, I want to assume that everybody does. So David, who was God's selection to be king, God actually chose David to be king because David was a man after God's own heart. As a boy, he set out in the fields and he played his harp and he worshipped God and he had a pure heart towards God. And God said, that's the man that I want to lead my people. And God, David was selected to be God's leader. And, and for years, David led God's people in righteousness and, and in the way that they should go. He wrote the majority of our psalms. He loved God. He was a man after God's own one day, David made a fatal mistake. Looked down across the balcony, he saw a beautiful woman, and he lusted after her, and he called her, called her to the palace. He seduced her, and he committed adultery. And if that wasn't enough, he tried to cover up his sin, what we talked about just a few moments ago. They ended up killing Uriah the Hittite in the process. And here's David, a godly man, who committed a gross in Psalm 51, he's pouring out his heart in confession to God. And by the way, David responded correctly to his sin. But he's pouring out his soul in confession to God. And we won't read the entire chapter, but I want you to see verse 16 and then verse 17 so we understand the context. David says this, For you will not delight in sacrifice, for I will give it. Let me just pause there for a second. So, so if you remember, the way that the Israelites worshipped God was through sacrifices, right? So, 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 so when they sinned, they would bring a lamb to the temple, a lamb without spot and blemish, and they would sacrifice that lamb to God. That's what God had commanded in the Old Testament law. That's the way that they worshipped God. And yet David says, wait a second, let me read it again. For God, you will not delight in sacrifice, for I would give you this. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. That's what God outlined in the Old Testament. And David's saying, right now in this situation, God, even if I offered, if I did these, these religious rituals that you have commanded me to do, and if I came and I offered them to you as a sacrifice, you would not accept them at this moment. Why is that? Verse 17. Because the sacrifices of God are broken spirits. A broken and a contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. Here's what God is saying. Listen, I just don't want a religious ritual. I'm just not looking for another lamb to be sacrificed. I'm not looking for more blood to be shed here. I'm not asking you just to go through the religious motions here. I'm not asking you to do something that you don't feel in your hearts. God says, no, you want to give a sacrifice to me? You have a broken heart before me for your sin. You want to have a sacrifice for me? You have a contrite heart before me in your sin. That is the sacrifice that I will receive. And we put that in modern day terms. Let's think about that. Thankfully, we don't offer sacrifices here every Sunday. Jesus was our ultimate sacrifice, and we don't have to offer sacrifices every Sunday. But let me just modernize the translation. 
God, I come to church every Sunday. Every Sunday I come and I, I present my sacrifice of attendance to you. God, I, I give you my offering on a regular basis. God, I'm doing all of these good things. I'm doing what you've asked me to do. Here's what God says. Are you broken for your sin? Are you contrite for your sin? Or are you coming and doing this religious act knowing that you're going to leave here and do the exact same thing that you did before? There's no change of heart. There's no change of repentance. It's an empty sacrifice. It's an empty offering. And God says, the sacrifice that I want from you is a broken heart for your sins. I want you to realize that your sins offend me. That's what I want. Let me, let, me, let, let me say this in your outline, and then I'll, I'll explain it. God is more pleased with sincere contrition than with religious tradition. God is more pleased with sincere contrition than he is with religious, or sincere, did I say that right? Sincere contrition than he is with religious tradition. So contrition isn't a word that we use very often. I venture to say nobody here has used it in the last seven days. Anybody used the word contrition in the last seven days? All right, all right. So, so, so anybody sit back and say, hey, um, hey, God, I want you to know that I'm contrite. No, no, we don't use that term. So, so, so here's contrition. Here's contrition. Contrition means that you have sorrow for your sin. You are revulsed by your sin. You don't excuse it. You don't blame it on somebody else. You realize that your sin, as minimal as you might think it is, you realize that your sin has offended a holy God. You have deep sorrow for that. You're broken. Your spirit when was the last time you were broken for your sin? Shoot, when was the last time I was broken for my sin? You sit back and think, it's only a lie. <laughs> it's only a, a curse word. It's only a disobedient act. What's the big deal? God says the big deal is that your sin, however you minimize it, your sin offends me. And I desire for you. Luke chapter 18, Jesus fleshes that out and he tells a parable. Let me read it to Luke chapter 18. You can follow along, verses 9 through 14. It says this, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So here's Jesus speaking to the self-righteous crowd. And he says, let me tell you a parable. And he says this, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one of the and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I even give tithes of everything that I get. <laughs> but the tax collector standing afar off did not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me. Now, who did God look upon with favor? Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. But let me tell you. Try to summarize that. So here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. Your brokenness, your confession, your repentance opens the door for God to do a work of grace in your life. Catch that. I know that guy. We're going to play that later, okay? Yeah, we're going to play that later. Um, your, your brokenness, your confession, your repentance opens the door 
for God to do a work of grace in your life. I'm so excited next Sunday. Guess what Brad's going to speak on? Grace. Grace, because God's response to brokenness is not anger. God's response to brokenness is not throwing inside. God's response to brokenness is what? It's grace. It's grace. Him demonstrating His grace in our life. But it's only when we're honest with ourselves, we, we admit our brokenness, we confess it, and we repent, that at that moment we open the door for God's grace. Let me ask you today, have you reached that place in your life? Have you reached that place in your life where you recognize your brokenness? Are you depending on your own goodness? Are you depending on your own spirituality? Are you depending on your own works? Listen. None of that impresses God. God never walks away and says, man, that Brian Burkholder is a fantastic guy. I tell you what, man, I wish we had more guys like Brian. I wish we had more pastors like Brian. I wish we had more husbands like Brian. Right? All of my good works are just like filthy rags in God's sight. The only thing that impresses him is when I turn to Jesus and I say, listen, it's not me, but it's Jesus in my life. That's what impresses him. Let me show you a third thing. The third thing is this. Only Jesus can fix your brokenness. Only Jesus can fix your brokenness. Let me just say this. That doesn't mean that, that there's no need for doctors. It doesn't mean that there's no need for medicine. So if you're here today and you're saying, well, I'm sick and only Jesus can fix it, so there you go. I'm not going to doctor, or, uh, or I'm broken, I'm not going to go to a recovery program. Well, that's not what we're saying. We would encourage you to go to a recovery program, all of that. But here's what we're saying. In reality, only Jesus can fix your brokenness. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I love in these verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. Actually, I want to begin in verse 5. I'm not going to put it up on the screen, so if you have your Bible, you've got to follow along, because verse 5 spoke to me today. As I was reading through this and praying through this this morning, Paul says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. I sat back and thought, well, that would be the goal of every preacher today. It's not ourselves that we're talking about, but it's Jesus, and we're simply his servants. Verse 6, for God said, for God, excuse me, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Let me pause there. So here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, God who created light and God who invaded darkness has shown the light of the gospel into our lives. Can I get an amen today? Isn't that fantastic? So God who created light has shown the light of the gospel into our lives. Verse 7, here's the verse I want you to catch. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We'll flesh that out. We are afflicted in every way, but not for we are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. I read those verses, and I'm like, well, that's like every day, right? All right, beaten down, but not destroyed. Perplexed, all of that. That's like life right there. But, but here's, what, here's what Paul says. God allows us to go through that. Verse 10. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus might be manifested through our bodies. Let, let me illustrate that today if I can. So I have here two jars of clay. These are actually flower pots, all right? So, so these things are pretty fragile, right? I know I have carpet right here, but what would happen if I took this and just dropped it? It'd break, right? It would shatter. 
And so, and so this, this jar represents your life and mine. So here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that God has taken the truth of the gospel, the light of the gospel, and he has placed it in jars of clay. All right? The idea being so what? So that his light, the light of the gospel, shines through us. Does that make sense today? But here's what happens. We want to think this is the way we are. We want to think that we have it all together. Do we not? And so we come in even to church on Sunday morning and we're like, we got it all together. So wife and I are arguing in the car on the way in. As soon as we walk in the door, we got a great big smile on our face. And everything's perfect. We got it all together. We're, we're dressed up. We don't have any problems. We're not struggling with anything. We're, we're a jar that there's no cracks in. At least that's the way we try to portray ourselves. But what happens when you put the light in a jar with no cracks? Nobody else can see it, right? So God's looking down and he sees, okay, I can see the lights in there, but no one else can see the light that's in there. So here's what God did. God said, I want to take my light and I'm not going to put it in perfect jars, but I'm going to take my light and I'm going to put it in imperfect jars. Can we cut the lights, guys? We got the lights so that here's why so that so that the light of the gospel shines through. You see that it keeps falling down. Well, this was a perfect illustration. <laughs> my, my wife was absolutely wowed with all of this. Can you see the light shining through there? Can you see it? All right. Listen, we can. Thank you. Turn the lights back on, guys. We can pretend as if we have it all together. And sometimes because of our pretending, we fail to let the truth of the gospel out. Yeah. But we sit back and say, I'm broken. I got cracks in my life. I'm not perfect. But God in his grace reached down in my brokenness. God broke into my life with the truth of the gospel. And I might not be, I'm trying my best to put my life back together, and it's not perfect, and life never is, because all of us have had ups and downs, and we've had struggles in our life, and you try to put your life back together, it never looks like it did in the beginning, but that's okay. Why is that? Because God desires to shine his light through God actually uses our brokenness. So, just a couple of things, and I'm done there. If you have your outlines, your brokenness gives him glory. Your brokenness gives him glory. Listen, when you're like this, you can sit back and say, hey, you know what? Everybody else is broken, but this is me. And who does that glorify? That glorifies you. But when you sit back and say, this is my life right here. I'm a hot mess. I'm broken. But God's changing me. Who gets the glory? God gets the glory. The second thing is this. Your brokenness makes you dependent upon Him. It makes you realize each and every day, I need God. I'm broken. I'm fallen. I wake up in the morning and think, okay, God, I got to be the husband of Vicky that I, that I need to be. And I don't have the strength to do it. God, I desperately need you. And God, I have to work and I can deal with all these people at work and I can't do it on myself, but by myself. God, I desperately need you. My brokenness demonstrates my dependence on God. The church lovingly, lovingly, because the same thing happens to me. We don't recognize our dependence. We think we're pretty good on our own. You said, Ryan, how do you know that? How much time do you spend in prayer? Your prayer life or your lack of prayer thereof shows how much you and I actually depend upon God. We say we need him, but we act as if we don't. We don't cry out to him. Your brokenness shows your dependence. And the last thing is this your brokenness 
gives others hope. You see, we're trying to reach our friends for Christ, and if we always present ourselves like this, so we have friends in our lives whose, whose, whose lives are broken, and they look at us and they think, man, I can never have a marriage like that. Or I can never have a life like that. Well, they got a perfect life. Everything's good. Because we what? We're always trying to present ourselves this way. We don't want anybody to see the cracks in our life. We don't want to be transparent. We don't want to show our weaknesses. We present ourselves as being whole all the time. And unbelievers sit back and say, I can never do that. I can never do that. But if we sit back and we show ourselves as this, and to sit back and say, I'm broken. But you know what? The glue that's holding me together is Jesus. And what's helping me be victorious in my life is Jesus. They sit back and say, I can do that. I can't do it on my own. But I can do it with Jesus. You see, it's our brokenness that makes us attractive to a lost. So, so here, here's my conclusion today. Allow Jesus to use your grief for his glory. Allow Jesus to show his power through your victory over addictions. Encourage others by showing them that Jesus can transform your marriage. Allow God to break into your life and change you for his glory. I'm broken. You're broken, but our brokenness actually makes us valuable to God. Would you stand with me today? We have videos that we're going to show. We have to kick that off next week with the videos. This we use Glenn's video next week. Our prayer team, our praise team is coming. And they're going to lead us in a song that just beautifully demonstrates this. It's a song called Broken Vessels. Let me give you the words of this song. God, you take our failure. You take our weakness. You set our treasure in jars of clay. So take this part, Lord. I'll be your vessel. The world to see your life. Can I be transparent? No, no. When we started this series, we sat back and thought, boy, this is going to be a great series because... We have a lot of people in our congregation that are struggling with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. So by the way, Brian leads our Celebrate Recovery program, and he'll be in the back. And if you're interested, he can give you all the info on that. Man, we're, we're 100% by, behind that. And we sat back and thought, well, there's a lot of people in our congregation that can use this. And then the Holy Spirit of God grabbed a hold of my heart and showed me that not only are those people broken, but I'm broken. I'm broken. I wish I could stand before you today and tell you that I'm a perfect pastor, that I never lose my temper, that I always treat my wife the way that I should, that I always respond with faith, that I never doubt, that I never get mad. I can't tell you that because I'm broken. And we realize this is what we need as a church. And until we come to the place, church, that we realize, God, we're broken and we desperately need you. And we cry out to you in desperation. God's not going to use us to the extent that he desires. And when we admit our brokenness, we confess our brokenness, we repent of our brokenness, and we turn to Jesus, he breaks into our lives. And uses us in a way that we can never imagine. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous, no, not one. Maybe you're here today and you live in this feeling of self righteousness today, and you've never actually recognized your need of Jesus. I encourage you today. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. You can't do it on your own. You can't. Come to Jesus. Maybe you're a believer that's for years. You've kind of just had this heart. You're better than everybody else. And you look around with people, people around you and you struggle with the brokenness of everybody else. And it's been a long time since you fell on your face before God and you cried out to God for your sin. Oh God. Admit that you're a broken vessel through which God 
desire us to shine as light. So thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for Jesus today. Thank you that it's Jesus who makes us valuable. Thank you that it's Jesus who transforms us. Thank you that it's Jesus who gives us hope. And I pray that Jesus would shine through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.